Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> this is so cool to be here and to play for you in this setting. Um, I, I've, I've never done this before, so this is a first for me. And I hope you're enjoying a little Debussy with your, your quiche. <laughs> so um, I want to thank Live Connections for inviting me and playing here at the World Cafe. Um, this is um, a true honor, and it was a lot of fun to put the program together. And it was a lot of fun to bring um, my friends and members of the Philadelphia Orchestra. So a little bit about this program. This sort of started out as an idea for a CD release party. Unfortunately, my CD isn't out till November 11th. So, so there's a postcard on all of your tables and you can visit my website, and um, if you're interested in getting my CD, you can find the information there. Um, it'll be on the Avi label, and it's titled Lays on Me, which is just like this program. Um, the, pro the, the program on the recording came together. Um, basically, I thought the works of Caplay and WC needed to be paired, and I was performing with the Iris Orchestra. I was invited there by Michael Stern to play the Debussy, uh, the Dance Sacre and Profane. And I said, we should pair The Mask of the Red Death. You know, these two works I've always felt would be great on one concert, and so we did. And then one thing led to another, and we did this recording. And so also on the recording is Debussy's Sonata for flute, viola, and harp. And Jeffrey Kaner and Roberto Diaz join me on that work. And then, um, these other little uh, solo works, this Petite Suite, which is so charming. And it sort of um, introduces Debussy's more youthful side, and it reflects also Bach's uh, French suites, if you know any of his keyboard suites. And it's in that same um, French Baroque dance suite style with the movements. And, um, but more, more interesting, I think, is the relationship as Les Amis that Caplay and Debussy built with one another. And the fact was that Debussy was not necessarily a real charming guy. He had, he had um, very high expectations. He scrutinized everyone around him to the nth degree. And he would, for a while, find somebody in his favor, and then he would sort of, you know, shoo them away. And in fact, one poor soul was um, Ernest Chausson, I don't know if you're familiar with Chanson Poem, the violin piece, but um, apparently he was so distraught from being excommunicated from Debussy's inner circle that he um, was riding his bike and um, down a very steep hill and uh, basically ran himself into a brick wall and killed himself. And so um, I guess he just, you know, found that. Life wasn't worth going on, which is a shame. And um, Debussy found a new protege, and that was Andre Caplet. And Caplet was a Prix de Rome winner, which is a big, big Paris composer's composition competition. And he relegated Maurice Ravel. Ravel got third. So it's interesting that Caplet he had a very brief life as a composer. He didn't live too long because of World War One and um, the um, poison of the gas um, that when he was in the military. And so, but what he did write, he wrote at a crucial point when this instrument was coming into its own. You'll often ask, why isn't there any harp in Beethoven or Brahms or you know any of the big Germanic composers? And that's because the keyboard was a la mode. It was, it was the instrument to write for, and the harp kind of got shoved to the side. And so, Behind my harp, I have, a, I have seven pedals, three on one side, four on the other. And these pedals, this mechanism, was not really perfected until right around um, 1880 in there. And there, there were two instrument houses in Paris, Playel and Erard. Playel decided this wasn't good enough, the pedal system. They were going to come up with a new harp, a harp chromatique which is a harp with two columns and the strings crisscross like this, and the columns crisscross. 
So on one side, you have a diatonic scale. You have all the, the naturals. And then on one side, you have all your accidentals, like all your black keys on the piano. And so this instrument um, went up against the pedal harp. But the Erard Instrument House made this new pedal harp. Anyway, because of this, we had this proliferation of harp music. And the dances were written by WC, The Mask of the Red Death, the um, Ravel introduction of Allegro, amongst many others. So we're really thankful for this competition that took place. Fortunately, the pedal harp won out. So good for me, because I can't imagine looking at those two rows of strings. So the next two pieces I'm going to play are by Caplet, Andre Caplet, the divertissement. And one is a la Française, in a very French style. I feel like it's like supported by wind, this, this piece. It's, it's very, very elegant, and it's just a lot of sheer color and energy. The second piece, a l'Espagnol, is in more of like about imagery, and he takes, it's like he takes little cross sections of Spanish life. So you hear perhaps some reflections of a flamenco dancer, or perhaps a toreador in a bull ring. And so there are all these little ideas sort of kind of come together in this collage. Um, so I'm going to play those two pieces for you. And you'll be interested to hear in the second one, the Al Espanol, I will really be using my pedals. Because he was so excited, Caplay. Once the chromatic harp kind of got shoved to the side, he's like, I want to write for the pedal harp. So he wrote this piece. And you'll be hearing me use the pedals like this. So I'll be sliding them. Usually we don't want to hear that noise. <laughs> but in this piece, it's, it's permitted. <laughs> so here is a la Francaise and a l'Espagnol.
Well, I'm just going to stay out here, and I'd like to introduce and welcome to the stage Anna Marie Peterson and Yumi Kendall, William Polk, and Amy Oshiro. <laughs>
This instrument is called a kora, it's K-O-R-A. And the first time someone recorded seeing it was in the 14th century, it was Ibn Battuta, who was an explorer. So certainly if he recorded it and saw it in the 14th century, they were playing it long before he got there. So string instruments, harp-like instruments, are featured prominently in cultures all around the world, and the continent of Africa is no exception. The kora in particular, and the tradition of oral telling to kora accompaniment, is found in Senegal, Gambia, Mali, Guinea, some parts of southern Mauritania as well. It is generally a male instrument, traditionally. It is passed down through specific families, those who have been for hundreds of years, the families who have had the responsibility of learning, remembering, and passing on the history, the traditions, the culture of their people. So my first teacher, the late Jimo Kuyate, always referred to the Kora as Sabu. And Sabu is a Mandinka word for connection. It is the connection between the people and their history. So let me just show you a little bit. I have to tell you that um, just recently, uh, baggage handlers from an unnamed airline snapped off my right handle. But it is often referred to as an African harp, a, a, a double bridge harp, because there are strings on two sides as opposed to one row of strings. So there are 11 strings on one side, 10 strings on the other side. Uh, it is made from a kind of rosewood known as keno, goes into an opening inside of a large gourd that's been hollowed out, which is the resonator for the instrument. And by the way, in many traditions, uh, if you really like what you hear, you drop a little money in there too. Um, so little boys begin when they're five, six, or seven years old, sitting on their father's laps, watching his fingers, or their father will make them a small kora. I was a little later. I was 15 plus, 10 plus, 13 plus 12. So I uh, haven't been playing quite as long. But one of the wonderful features about the oral tradition in West Africa and the playing of the kora is that there is also participation on the part of the listener. And songs feature prominently in the telling of stories as well. There's an old proverb that says, the ruin of a nation begins in the homes of its people. And if you want a nation, a village that is peaceful, you must first practice peace yourself, right where you are. So this song, Kelefaba Kelemani, is one of the first ones that someone learns in their learning Kora. Ask the question, who are you gonna make peace with today? With your mother, your father, your children, your in-laws, your co-workers? So I'm going to ask you to join me in posing that question. I'm going to have you sing this line. Kelefaba. That's your line. Kelefaba. Kelefaba. Turn to someone you know and ask it. A little louder. Ah, there you are. Turn to someone you don't know. Someone on your left. Someone on your right. Keep that going.
for something a little bit different. This is Edgar Allan Poe's Mask of the Red Death. The Red Death had long devastated the country. No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar, its seal, the redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. The scarlet stains upon the body and especially upon the face of the victim where the pest ban would shut him out from the aid and from the sympathy of his fellow men. And the whole seizure, progress, and termination of the disease were incidents of half an hour. But the prince, Prospero, was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence a thousand hale and light-hearted friends from among the knights and dames of his court, and with these retired to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the prince's own eccentric yet august taste. A strong and lofty wall girdled it in. This wall had gates of iron. The courtiers, having entered, brought furnaces and massy hammers and welded the bolts. They resolved to leave means neither of ingress or egress to the sudden impulses of despair or of frenzy from within. The abbey was amply provisioned. With such precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had provided all the appliances of pleasure. There were buffoons, there were improvisatory, there were ballet dancers, there were musicians, there was beauty, there was wine. All these and security were within. Without was red death. It was toward the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion and while the pestilence raged most furiously abroad that the Prince Prospero entertained his thousand friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. But first, let me tell you of the rooms in which it was held. There were seven, an imperial suite. In many palaces, however, such suites form a long and straight vista while the folding doors slide back nearly to the walls on either hand so that the view of the whole extent is scarcely impeded. Here, the case was very different, as it might have been expected from the Duke's love of the bazaar. The apartments were so irregularly disposed that the vision embraced but little more than one at a time. There was a sharp turn at every 20 or 30 yards and at each turn, a novel effect. To the right and left, in the middle of each, a wall. Tall, a narrow, gothic window looked out upon the closed corridor which pursued the windings of the suite. These windows were of stained glass whose color varied in accordance with the prevailing hue of the decorations of the chamber into which it opened. That at the eastern extremity was hung, for example, in blue, and vividly blue were its windows. The second chamber was purple in its ornaments and tapestries, and here the panes were purple. The third was green throughout, and so were the casements. The fourth was furnished and lighted with orange, the fifth with white, the sixth with violet. The seventh apartment was so closely shrouded in black velvet tapestries that hung all over the ceiling and down the walls, falling into heavy folds upon a carpet of the same material and hue, but in this chamber only. The color of the windows failed to respond with the decorations. The panes here were scarlet. 
a deep blood color. Now in no one of the seven apartments was there any lamp or candelabrum amid the profusion of golden ornaments that lay scattered to and fro or depended from the roof. There was no light of any kind emanating from lamp or candle within the suite of chambers. But in the corridors that followed the suite, there stood opposite to each window a heavy tripod bearing a brazier of fire that protected its rays through the tinted glass and so glaringly illumined the room. And thus were produced a multitude of gaudy and fantastic appearances. But in the western or black chamber, the effect of the firelight that streamed upon the dark hangings through the blood-tinted panes was ghastly in the extreme and produced so wild a look upon the countenances of those who entered that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot within its precincts at all. It was in this apartment also that there stood against the western wall a gigantic clock of ebony. Its pendulum swung to and fro with a dull, heavy, monotonous clang. And when the minute hand made the circuit of the face and the hour was to be stricken, there came from the brazen lungs of the clock a sound which was clear and loud and deep and exceedingly musical, but of so peculiar a note and emphasis that at each lapse of an hour, the musicians of the orchestra were constrained to pause momentarily in their performance, hearken to the sound. And thus, the waltzers, perforce, ceased their evolutions. And there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. And while the chimes of the clock yet rang, it was observed that the giddiest grew pale. And the more aged and sedate passed their hands over their brows as if in confused reverie or meditation. But when the echoes had fully ceased, a light laughter at once pervaded the assembly. The musicians looked at each other and smiled as if at their own nervousness and folly and made whispering bows to each other that the next chiming of the clock should produce in them no similar emotion. And then after the lapse of 60 minutes, which embraced 3,600 seconds of the time that flies, there came yet another chiming of the clock, and then were the same disconcert and tremulousness and meditation as before. But in spite of these things, it was a gay and magnificent revel. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar. He had a fine eye for colors and effects. He disregarded the decora of mere fashion. His plans were bold and fiery, and his conceptions glowed with barbaric luster. There are some who would have thought him mad. His followers felt that he was not. It was necessary to hear and to see and to touch him to be sure that he was not. He had directed in great part the movable embellishments of the seven chambers upon occasion of this great feat, and it was his own guiding taste which had given character to the masqueraders. Be sure. They were grotesque. There were much glare and glitter and piquancy and phantasm, much of what has been seen in Hernani. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust to and fro in the seven chambers, there stalked, in fact, a multitude of dreams. And these, the dreams, writhed in and about, taking hue from the rooms and causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. And anon, there strikes the ebony clock which stands in the hall of the velvet, and then for a moment, all is still. And all is silent, save the voice of the clock. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand. But the echoes of the chime die away. They have endured but an instant. And a light, half-subdued laughter 
floats after them as they depart. And now again, the music swells and the dreams live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever, taking hue from the many tinted windows through which stream the rays from the tripods. But to the chamber which lies most westwardly of the seven, there are now none of the maskers who venture. For the night is waning away and there flows a ruddier light through the blood-colored panes and the blackness of the sable drapery appalls, and to him whose foot falls upon the sable carpet, there comes from the near clock of ebony a muffled peal more solemnly emphatic than any which reaches their ears who indulge in the more remote gaieties of the other apartments. But these other apartments were densely crowded, and in them beat feverishly the heart of life. And the revel went whirlingly on until at length there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock. And then the music ceased, as I have told, and the evolutions of the waltzers were quieted, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now, there were 12 strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, and thus it happened. Perhaps that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of the thoughtful among those who reveled. And thus too, it happened perhaps that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. And the rumor of this new presence Having spread itself whisperingly around, there arose at length from the whole company a buzz, a murmur, expressive of disapprobation and surprise, and then finally of terror, of horror, of disgust. In an assembly of phantasms such as I have painted, it may well be supposed that no ordinary appearance could have excited such sensation. In truth, the masquerade license of the night was nearly unlimited. But the figure in question had outherited Herod, and gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. There are chords in the hearts of the most reckless which cannot be touched with emotion, even with the utterly lost to whom life and death are equally jests. There are matters of which no jest can be made. The whole company indeed seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger, neither wit nor propriety existed. The figure was tall and gaunt and shrouded from head to foot in the habiliments of the grave. The mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse that the closest scrutiny must have had difficulty in detecting the cheat, and yet all this might have been endured if not approved by the mad revelers around. But the murmur had gone so far as to assume the type of the Red Death. His vesture was dabbled in blood. His broad brow with all the features of the face was besprinkled with a scarlet horror. When the eyes of Prince Prospero fell upon the spectral image, which with a slow and solemn movement, as if more fully to sustain its role, stalked to and fro among the waltzers. He was seen to be convulsed in the first moment with a strong shudder of either terror or distaste, but in the next, his brow reddened with rage. Who dares, he demanded hoarsely of the courtiers who stood near him, who dares insult us with this blasphemous mockery? Seize him, unmask him, that we may know whom we have to hang at sunrise from the battlements. It was in the eastern or blue chamber in which stood the Prince Prospero as he uttered these words. They rang throughout the seven rooms loudly and clearly, for the prince was a bold and robust man, and the music had become hushed at the waving of his hand. It was in the blue room where stood the prince with a group of pale courtiers by his side. At first, as he spoke, there was a slight rushing movement of this group in the direction of the intruder, who at the moment was also near at hand, and now with deliberate and stately step, made closer approach to the speaker. But from a certain nameless awe, 
with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth hand to seize him, so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person, and while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly, but with the same solemn, measured step which had distinguished him from the first through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white and even thence to the violet air, a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that the Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers while none followed him on account of the deadly terror that had seized upon all. He bore aloft a drawn dagger and had approached in rapid impetuosity to within three or four feet of the retreating figure when the latter, having attained the extremity of the velvet apartment, turned suddenly and confronted his pursuer. There was a sharp cry and the dagger dropped, gleaming upon the sable carpet upon which instantly afterwards fell prostrate in death, the prince, Prospero, then summoning the wild courage of despair, a throng of the revelers at once threw themselves into the black apartment and seizing the mummer, whose tall figure stood erect and motionless within the shadow of the ebony clock, gasped in unutterable horror at finding the grave cerements and corpse-like mask which they handled with so violent a rudeness, untenanted by any tangible form, and now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night. And one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay and the flames of the tripods expired, and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all.